Okay, welcome everybody. It's really a major pleasure to have here today Massimo Stiavelli. So his uh, curriculum might take uh, one colloquium, so I will try really to uh, summarize the main uh, achievement of his, uh, of his uh, career. So um, let me just say that uh, it's the second time in the history that uh, a scientist and astronomer from Pisa come to Padova. So this is a, a very uh, important uh, follow-up, <laughs> I would say. But uh, coming really to the, to the most recent uh, uh, history of, uh, of uh, astronomy, you will see today uh, the really impressive result by the James Webb Space Telescope. Let me remind that uh, um, Massimo graduated and did his PhD in Pisa in the Scuola Normale. Then he started moving a bit all around the world. He was in New Jersey at the Rutgers, then he went back to Europe uh, to the European Southern Observatory, then uh, he came back uh, to Pisa. I might uh, miss uh, some of the jumps, but uh, it's uh, in the, around the mid of the 90s that uh, he went to, to the Space Telescope where he really uh, was one of the people who was able to see uh, the, the, the major activities uh, and the preparations of the Hubble Space telescope which is still working but uh, you will see about the <laughs> the new result from the the space telescope so he has a long uh, list of award let me remind that now he has led the James Webb Space Telescope mission office and uh, recently last year he received the NASA outstanding public leadership award for his manage management work in the space telescope JWST and uh, he also was one of the builder of the uh, WFPC, the wide field camera on, uh, on the HST, and uh, he was uh, uh, one of the planner of the deepest uh, survey with the Hubble Space Telescope. And the history is then uh, all around uh, the major activity about the James Webb, and just the, the last more recent uh, uh, awards uh, in 2018, he was elected fellow of the American Association for the advancement of scientists and uh, in 2021 uh, we are very happy that he was elected as a foreign fellow of the Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei, uh, the, the major Italian academy. So I give the word to, to Massimo and thanks for being here. At the end there will be time for questions from many of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for the great introduction. I have a lot of material, I'll try to go through both some technical aspects and some scientific aspects of the telescope and say a few things also about, if there is time, about some of the things I like to do with it. So I'll talk about what is the James Webb Space Telescope, some both planned and already done science results and possibly some results from my collaboration. That last part is a little lagging behind uh, for various practical reasons. So uh, here's a comparison of the mirrors for the Spitzer Space Telescope, Hubble, and JWST. As you can see, uh, Webb is a much lar larger mirror. And in fact, it's made of 18 segments of uh, beryllium coated in gold for reasons of thermal stability. And a single one of the web segments has bigger collecting area than Spitzer. So already with the first mirror, we were beating Spitzer in sensitivity uh, at the wavelength where we operate. The, the interesting thing is that web, despite the much larger mirror, is about half the mass of Hubble. So we had to fit all of that into half the mass. Why large? Uh, we need a large mirror in order to have sensitivity and angular resolution. Sensitivity because a large area gives you collecting area, you get a lot of photons. And uh, angular resolution is, you know, the resolution of a telescope at a given wa wavelength is the, the inverse of the diameter. And so the bigger the diameter, the higher the angular resolution. Uh, we wanted infrared for essentially three reasons. 
One, there are objects in our galaxy that are enshrouded in dust, and infrared allows to see through dust, so you can study these objects. Second, we want to study very distant galaxies, and they, their light is redshifted. And in fact, we want to go to see objects that are so distant that essentially they have no emission in the visible. So you need an infrared telescope to see them and study them. And the third is that there are interesting molecules that we are interested in that emit especially in the infrared. So you need infrared sensitivity to study them. Uh, I will not show that picture, but it is interesting that some people were afraid that the JWST pictures would be boring because they were thinking, oh, you go through the dust, what makes nice pictures with Hubble is the dust and gas, you see through it, so the images are going to be boring. What these people had not considered is that the, these molecules, like for instance, PAH molecules, uh, emit in the infrared. So when you see the Carina nebula, Yes, you see through the nebula, but you also see the emission of the, uh, of the PAH molecules in, emi you know, in emission, and that's what the, the, this is the cosmic cliffs image that I'm sure you've seen from last year. So um, here's a little description of some of the characteristics. I indirectly already mentioned the, the Ah, uh, a 6.5 meter primary mirror. Uh, it has four instruments, uh, a near infrared camera, a near infrared spectrograph, a mid infrared imager and spectrograph, and uh, a Canadian instrument that is essentially an imager and a slitless spectrograph, optimized for either galaxies or exoplanets. Uh, it is non-serviceable and but it doesn't have consumables except for fuel. It, it orbits the Lagrangian point L2 of the Earth-Sun system. That point is a settled point in the gravitational potential, so it's stable it's an, in one direction and stable in the other. So if you orbit that point, you need to spend fuel or you will drift away with any folding of roughly a month. And so you need to not to get too far and uh, use fuel to, to maintain that orbit. Uh, so we meant to have a five-year primary mission with a goal of 10 years, limited by the amount of fuel. The, we are the Science and Flight Operations Center. This is a change over Hubble. We do science operations for Hubble, but flight operations, which means you know, checking that the rea reaction wheels uh, are, are doing fine, the batteries are charged, the solar panel work is done by a Goddard, which is down the road from from us. For web, we do also the flight operation. And this is a picture of the flight operation center in, uh, in, in Baltimore uh, during, probably this was a launch rehearsal. We did a lot of uh, rehearsal exercises before the actual launch. And uh, during commissioning between these and the neighboring rooms, we had about 70 to 80 people on shift 24-7. The original plan was 100. We went through that because of COVID, tried to reduce the number of people to a minimum. And uh, we also expanded the footprint to allow for more social distancing because we didn't want people, critical people, to get sick uh, during commissioning. Uh, an interesting feature of the deployments, of course, the, the telescope is launched all folded up to fit into the Ariane 5 shroud, and then it deploys. The interesting feature of the deployments is that there are 178 release mechanisms. These are all uh, single point failures. So if one of them fails, you're done. So this requires a certain degree of uh, attention. And then we have 132 actuators that are behind the mirror segments. And they are the ones that have to move these 1.3 meters mirrors uh, with essentially the, resol the resolution of one nanometer, which is needed to get the alignment to the degree that we want. And, uh, and of course, we serve the astronomical community. So here's the last time I saw it. Uh, this is a Northrop Grumman. See, the sun shield was not uh, tensioned, was deployed. 
and the, the, the side wings of the primary were not deployed. And I had the same tie, as Alvio noticed, I think. <laughs> so this is the... And we have engine start. And lift off. Decollage, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. So this was 7.30 uh, in the morning uh, on Christmas Day. Our folks had been on 24-7 shifts already for two days at that point, checking the telemetry from the observatory from Kuru. And uh, so this was, you know, the interesting thing. The most interesting thing was about half an hour later. So the upper stage of the Ariane 5 for the first time had a camera, so we could see JWST leaving the, the, the Ariane. The little blue things you see at some point are the thrusters that are adjusting the attitude of the spacecraft. The, you, you just saw something there. There will be a few more. Uh, there are a lot of things I could describe here, but uh, so the observatory was uh, programmed to deploy on its own the solar panel when the, its attitude was just right. And if it didn't do it, then we could command it from the ground. The launch was so perfect that it, yeah, here you see it, that it didn't need a lot of adjustment and it satisfied the conditions very early. So you will see the solar panel deploy uh, on its own about 28 minutes after launch. We didn't know whether we would capture it in, on camera. It just happened that we did. So this was a pretty good thing. You know, being power positive in a spacecraft is a good thing. Um, Otherwise, the mission lifetime would have been nine hours instead of five, of five years. Uh, so this is commissioning. Following launch, we have about two weeks of real commissioning. Uh, and then there are, you know, we have to move the mirror segments of the launch supports. And then the telescope has to start uh, cooling. Then we align the telescope with an iterative process. If you, if you just take the 18 segments and align them so that their images are on the same spot. What you have is the collecting area of a 6.5 meter telescope, but the point spread function is that of a 1.3 meter segment. So you have a bad point spread function, star images are fat. But then you do the coherent uh, alignment so that the, the images interfere constructively and the PSF Shrink, shrinks down to that of a 6.5 meter segment. And that's why you need positional accuracy controllable to the nanometers to get you know, a single shape. And that would take about three months. And then in the last two months, we uh, commissioned the instruments. Oh, this is the, the Carina Nebula that I mentioned with the PAH emission that you see all over. So we were pretty proud. This plan was thousands of activities uh, and had been prepared and tuned for years before launch. We know exactly we do this and then we do that and then we would do that. And uh, a moment of pride uh, was this. After the roughly two weeks, we were in the configuration of the all major deployments completed. According to our plan, we were supposed to be done 14 days, two hours, and 40 minutes from launch. We finished 14 days, three hours, eight minutes from launch. So if you are Swiss, sorry, we are 28 minutes late. Uh, if you are not Swiss, it was a great success. Uh, so uh, JWST beats requirements in almost every area. The optical quality is uh, much better than required. We are essentially diffraction, lim diffraction limited at one micron instead of two microns because of the exceptional mirror quality. The telescope is very stable and uh, we take data every two days to check the shape 
and we have the ability to correct it, but we find that we need to correct it every six weeks or so instead of the two, three weeks that we thought we would need. So the telescope is, uh, stays in the right shape. Uh, the whole observatory is stable. The point instability is, is about one milliard second RMS. So you can stare at the spots and move about with an RMS of one milliard seconds, which is way better than requirements. The, the sensitivity beats expectation in most mode. We have moving targets, not super fast. The requirement was 30 milliard seconds per second, because this is a big floppy telescope, so it's not designed to steer fast. Uh, when the DART probe hit uh, the asteroid Dimorphos, the satellite of Didymos, uh, we were asked to try to image that, and that thing moves at 105 milliard second per second, 3.5 times faster than the requirement, and we could do it. It's not the kind of thing we want to do often because, you know, twice the requirement, it's easy. Once you push beyond that, it requires some effort to make sure we have all the guy stars and so on, but it can be done. And finally, lifetime, Christmas, in terms of trajectory, was a great day to launch. It's like the, close to the minimum fuel. Uh, the Ariane launch was perfect. So it was, you know, the launch that required us to do the smallest correction we could think of. The correction, we have a magical time to do it, which is 12 and a half hours um, after launch, which explains why my day on Christmas 2021 was sort of long. Uh, and uh, if you, you cannot do this burn, which we call MCC1A, mm -hmm. too early, because we need to know exactly the trajectory. And the trajectory is measured from the ground stations doing telemetry. So, we, we need those data to know exactly where we are so that we can determine exactly the burn to know where, you know, where we want to go. And uh, if you wait, it will take more fuel. So the 12 and a half hours is the magical point, and we were able to do it exactly at that time. And uh, so you put it all together, and we have fuel for more than 20 years instead of 10. So it's like... Luck is likely that fuel will not be the limiting factor. Obviously, people were happy. This is, uh, uh, if I could read what's written on the consoles, I could tell you which room it is. It's probably the way from sensing room. Uh, this is a, a family picture. Uh, the instruments can, in principle, be operated all in parallel. So this is what you would see if you turn them all, all on. Uh, however, we don't have data volume from L2 to, to use them regularly all together. So we, we only use smaller subsets. Uh, from L2, we have a, a bandwidth of 28 megabits per second. And uh, so it's... Uh, you know, if you have good internet at home, it's higher than that. On the other hand, your home is not 1.5 million kilometers away. So, so, obviously, the telescope was meant to study distant galaxies, and that's one of the things it did. This is from the early release observations that showed a lot of, uh, you know, it's a Lansing cluster, so a lot of distorted galactic shapes and some weird objects, which I can't see now. But, uh, and similarly, for nearby galaxies, we see the, the benefit of going to the infrared. You, you not only you, you go through the dust lane, you see the dust in emission, you see features like this giant bubble, probably blown by a supernovae, which, if you know it's there, you can sort of see it in the Hubble image, but he wouldn't guess it if you didn't see the, the infrared image. So, great things on the study of nearby galaxies. Pretty powerful in the study of the solar system. These are just three of the planets. Uh, people got greedy. They thought, you know, every planet has rings. So we got a proposal to look for the rings on Mars. I don't know if they will find any, but uh, they'll tell us if they find them. Uh, 
So this was a calibration image for Jupiter. Uh, and people are actually learning things about Jupiter from that image. Uranus, Neptune, uh, you know, Triton is actually fainter than Neptune in the visible, but in, in the, if you go in the infrared, you get methane clouds complicating things and you get that, that image. So having this kind of resolution from, you know, near Earth is very powerful because you can, uh, study uh, meteorology, say, on a planet without needing to have uh, a spacecraft there. But you can also plan local spacecraft in much, with much better accuracy. For instance, we have measured the extent of the water plumes from Enceladus. Enceladus has these uh, giant geysers that eject water. And suppose you want to design a mission that gets samples of that water from, from you know, coming from under, from, from the underground ocean in Enceladus, it, you know, knowing how long is the plume allows you to better plan for that mission, and we can do that now. We have a lot of time invested on exoplanets. In fact, exoplanets rivals galaxies as the most uh, uh, popular field of research for JWST, this is uh, a sketch of what happens when you do a transit observations. The planet passes in front of the star, and of course it reduces the flux you measure from the star. Not only that, but the planet has a, if the planet has an atmosphere, the starlight will go through the planet atmosphere, and molecules in the planet atmospheres will leave a signature in the starlight that you can measure. It's a pretty complex measurement, it requires high accuracy, we can do it. And the idea is that if we are lucky, we'll see somewhere, this is from the solar system, Venus and Mars, you see carbon dioxide, maybe we'll see a planet like Earth that has ozone and water. And so we know that that's a planet that is at least uh, uh, in principle uh, compatible with life. This is a sketch of the equilibrium temperature and planet radius for the targets in the first year of JWST observations for the exoplanet that are being studied. One of the most interesting exoplanets that are studied, in my opinion, is this. The reason I'm saying most interesting is that in the solar system, there are four rocky planets. Mercury has almost no atmosphere. Mars has a very thin atmosphere. Venus has a very dense atmosphere, which would be probably hard to see from another uh, solar system because it, uh, of a high altitude haze that doesn't let you see what's deep inside. The Earth would be one that we could possibly measure. We don't know a single exoplanet, rocky exoplanet with an atmosphere, zero. And so this is the first tentative detection of a, this is a super Earth, 1.3 uh, times the diameter of the Earth. It's a hot, it's a warm, egg, uh, rocky world. And there is a tentative detection of water in the atmosphere of this planet. However, it could be hot water vapor in the star spots of the star, which is a red dwarf. And, uh, and these two curves show what you would see if it's the star spots or the planet. And so uh, people are looking at doing additional observation to try to distinguish the, the two possibilities. If it's uh, confirmed, this would be the first rocky world with, a, with a, an atmosphere. Uh, another target that is very popular is Tra Trappist-1. This is a, a, a system around a small red dwarf with seven rocky exoplanets. JWST will study all of them. We already know that B doesn't have an atmosphere. Uh, and uh, because the, the red dwarf is much fainter, the habitable zone, which is green, the one where the planet receives enough light to keep water liquid, is much in. And in fact, the old system would live well within the orbit of Mercury. Uh, so we don't know what we will see for these other exoplanets, but you know, they're all being studied, and of course, folks are very interested in, in this. Uh, fine biomarkers, you know, in case one of these is as a confirmed atmosphere, finding biomarkers is a, is a challenging uh, 
project for, for all of this. So we can do it, but it would become probably the equivalent of a Hubble deep field type of effort. So we want to make sure which one are the best targets. I could say more about this, but I'll, I'll, I don't have the time, but I could ask questions. If, um, so let's go into extragalactic. You know, obviously people were excited already the day of the press release because of this spectrum. This is a galaxy at redshift, uh, I think, hey, maybe the 8.5. Uh, and, uh, well, I could do the math, but uh, it's probably. Um, so obviously we were hoping to see oxygen, and you know, this is oxygen 3H beta. But we start seeing things like uh, oxygen uh, 34363, which is a line that used to be hard to find in local galaxies. Neon lines, uh, a lot of Balmer lines. So these really told us that we could do a lot of what we wanted to do in terms of measuring properties, metallicities, gas temperatures for distant galaxies. A lot has been said about whether JWST has broken cosmology. You can read the popular press. There are a lot of statements along th these lines. I don't think that's true, at least yet. What is true is that we see more galaxies that are at redshift than expected, at higher redshift than expected. They're brighter than expected. And they cluster more than we thought they would. Now, what does it tell us? Well. When you do model predictions for galaxies, you have two steps. One is knowing what the dark matter halos that these galaxies form in do. And one is how you convert the gas in these halos into stars. My impression is that, and this may be a biased impression from the fact that we don't see it, but we know better about how dark matter moves because it's just gravitation, then how you form ga turn gas into stars. So when the model's prediction don't work, before throwing away the cosmology, I would want to make sure that I understand galaxy formation well enough. So JWST may be telling us about galaxy formation, not about cosmology. This is an old plot that I did with Michele uh, to kind of do some rough predictions. And here we just use dark halo statistics assuming that magic would happen and we get an M over L that is reasonable, filling those halos. And if you uh, use that conservative, very simple-minded model, we would predict many redshift 10 galaxies per near come field of view, maybe one redshift 12 galaxy per near come field of view, and maybe one redshift 14 galaxy every five or 10 near come images. And so far, if you look at the spectroscopically confirmed redshifts, that's not very different from what we see. We see a lot of 10s, some 12 to 13, and at least when I left Baltimore, no, nothing higher than 13 had been confirmed spectroscopically. There are a lot of claims based on photometry alone. So uh, I think there are some surprises still, but not as big as you could derive from looking at the press. So here are some of the spectra for this redshift 13. This is a 13, this is a 12. Uh, you know, these are faint galaxies. We can see the continuum. We don't see lines that would betray a lower redshift. So we think that this is a, a good candidate at redshift 13. There are some candidates at higher redshift. Some has been, have been uh, disproven. Some are still in the run. We will see whether any of them are confirmed by spectroscopy. People have been building luminosity functions, how many galaxies are per luminosity bin, and uh, they seem to evolve less than people would expect. Uh, but again, the real uh, challenge would be what happens when you go beyond 12, uh, 13 or 14. Um, that's where predictions would diverge a lot. We don't, from observations if it kept going like this. I already mentioned metallicity. This is the same galaxy that I showed earlier. You can see a lot of lines. And uh, it has also been observed with ALMA. 
Here is when it, where it lands in the mass metallicity relation. So it's, a, you know, we, it's amazing that we can do this kind of study at redshift 8.5, really looking in detail at the gas properties of, a, of an object at that distance. So this is very promising for study galaxy formation. This is a different galaxy, redshift 10. Uh, and again, you see a whole slew of emission lines, which is you know, pretty impressive to be able to do these kind of studies at, at redshift 10. You know, before JWST, we only had one confirmed object at redshift 10. <laughs> and now not only we know it's there, but we can determine its composition. Uh, a lot more galaxy properties. We are starting to learn the importance of having mid-infrared data, not stopping at five, but going beyond five microns. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, spectra from JWST so far. Uh, so this is a galaxy at redshift 4.7 that is quiescent. And it has been quiescent for hundreds of millions of years. So uh, there used to be a big debate where the elliptical galaxies formed by merger or just by collapse and sit there and passively evolve. The, I don't know. My, you, one need, would need to run detailed statistics. My guess is that both, because certainly this looks like an elliptical that formed and didn't do anything much later. We may even know why it didn't do much afterwards. There is an AGN. Maybe that AGN had uh, an outburst and cleaned up the, the interstellar medium of that object that had to stop forming stars. I mean, but certainly seeing Balmer line in absorption at this redshift, you know, was for many of us a surprise. I was even more surprised because in this paper they say, well, this galaxy, it's as if it stopped forming stars at redshift 7.2. And then some guy took a spectrum of this galaxy that is not forming stars at redshift 7.3. So this object, it, which is too small to be a, pre, a progenitor of this, however, stopped forming stars, is not forming stars now, and stopped forming stars at about the redshift where the progenitor of these stopped. So these things are happening. And if people had been told, oh, you have galaxies that are actually seven and are not star forming, they would have not believed you uh, before GWST launched. Of course, we can see AGNs. This is uh, not necessarily the most robust, but one of the most interesting AGNs, uh, 10 to the 7 solar masses black hole at Reshif 8.7. If you place it in this diagram, it would sit there. And it's yet another evidence that you cannot make that black hole starting from a, even a 100 solar masses black hole and accreting an Eddington rate. You, to make it, you need to either accrete at super Eddington in various stages, like the purple curve, or you start from a, direct, a more massive direct collapse black hole. Uh, I find both interesting, even, you know, this is the easy way out because you say, oh, a miracle happens and explains it. So it better work, otherwise you should look for a better miracle. Uh, here, this is the interesting, challenging method. So I, I, I don't, you know, most people believe in the miracle, but uh, I haven't seen totally convincing evidence that the other mechanism cannot work. I mentioned briefly clustering early on. This is, I think there are actually seven galaxies here, but only six in this plot. Uh, a protocluster at redshift 7.9. And I call it a protocluster because these objects are confirmed spectroscopically, and they are you know, within 100 kiloparsecs or so. So uh, this thing is very interesting. And I remember, and people in the audience will remember that, you know, a few years ago, if somebody talked about a protocluster at redshift above one or two, they, people would start making objections. How do you know that? <laughs> I mean, it was hard to convince people. And now you see a potentially a protocluster at redshift 7.9, much higher 
than, uh, than people would have thought. Here is something that is important, but the results are not really, some are in the hands of the proposers, but they haven't really been published yet, by and large. You may know about the cosmological tension. In fact, that local universe measurements, where local is you know, up to hundreds of megaparsecs with the type 1a supernovae, and CMB-based measurements are in disagreement. The so-called cosmological tension. What is the right H naught? And uh, now there is, there are two new methods that have been proposed. One is the tip of the Regian branch that tends to give results in the middle. And the other one, which is the, cosmo, uh, the cosmochronology, chronography, is based, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. But that, depending on the assumptions you need to make about the lens galaxies, could also be in the middle. So is there an actual tension or not? I hope that JWST over maybe even the next year will tell us whether these measurements are here or move or what. There are a lot of uh, cross calibrations that, are, that have been proposed and people are working on it. So what is the cosmochronology? If you have a strong lens, here's the quasar. Imagine people often use four uh, quasar images, quads, but you know, here's, I'm only drawing two. You have light that goes like this and light that goes like this. Because of their different path, this is the lens. Uh, it takes longer to light on B uh, or on A uh, than to, oh no, on B than light on A. And so there is a time delay. If you monitor the quasar, and quasars are often a little variability, and you cross correlate the A light and the B light, you discover that A light uh, has a delay, you know, B light has a delay over A light. And so you can measure the difference in path which is just the delta t times c of the two paths. But now the path length depends on h naught and on the cosmological parameters. So with one lens, you, can, you get a measurement of these things, h naught and cosmological parameters. Of course, it will be with errors, and then you use multiple lenses to do it. It depends on the model of the lens, and that's why I said that the result is in agreement with the Cepheid and type 1a supernovae distance scale or not, depending on what you assume the lens to be. If you assume the lens to be, they're all early type galaxies, to be like the early type galaxies in the nearby universe that we know very well, the result tends to agree with the Cepheids and type 1a supernovae. If you do a, an open parametric model that allows more freedom, then the result moves toward the middle. And the idea of using JWST is to study the properties of the lens galaxy so that you can see which one of the two is right and either confirm one or the other. And last, another interesting application in my mind, this is pretty far-fetched. There are two ways that JWST can constrain the spectrum of dark matter halos to see if it's CDM or warm dark matter. This is potentially one of them. Uh, population three stars, these are the, the first stars that are made of primordial composition, what you get out of the Big Bang. We think they're very massive. We think they can produce, uh, they go off in, at certain masses as per instability supernovae, and uh, they form in mini halos. And if, you, if CDM is right, you have lower mass mini halos, and they will form stars at higher redshift. If CDM is not right and dark matter is uh, you know, some form of massive neutrinos or something else, then they will form a lower redshift. So if you could, in principle, measure the rate with redshift of pair instability supernovae, you could know the mass spectrum of the dark halos where they form, and then know if it's CDM or warm dark matter. This is extraordinarily complex to measure. This is what you would get probably with a program of 300 hours per year of monitoring. So the rate of pair instability supernovae are expected to be very low. Uh, 
with Roman that has a larger field of view, we can probably do the experiment up to Reshi 14. Unfortunately, at Reshi 14, uh, you really want to run with redshift, not just the absolute value, because that depends too much on the model, while the change with redshift is more solid. So Roman will tell us something about this, but uh, it would be nice to see the, the higher redshift component. And that, because of wavelength, only JWST could do. Um, so what have I done with the telescope myself? Uh, we've done a couple of things. With Takahiro, we have looked at the field that was uh, released. And instead of trying to hunt the highest redshift galaxies like everybody else was doing, we asked ourselves, how, is, how secure is the photometric redshift selection or the Lyman break selection at these redshifts where we have no calibration? So what we did is that we applied our kind of robust uh, model, both to the field and the parallel field. And uh, uh, the, the blue squares are the, pho the photometric, you know, the Lyman break selections, and the orange points are selected from photo Zs. And we require both for the, our most reliable sample. So the, the, the objects have to satisfy the photometric cuts. And when you do photometric redshift on those objects, the photometric redshift has to be where you want it. So we did a blind test, and we find for the objects in the primary field, we find four candidates that pass over the criteria, and all four are actually spectroscopically confirmed at high redshift. So small number statistics, but if you do the selection very carefully, it seems to be reliable. What is interesting is that two of those objects were detected by Hubble alone, and were found to be a low redshift. So that tells you that if you don't have photo, if you don't have bands that go to the infrared, not only you may miss high redshift galaxies, which is what we know happens, but you may even misjudge low redshift, you know, high redshift galaxies to be a low redshift because you are always at the clear close to the noise level, so the little blip in noise that you think it's a, a detection in a band may actually be just noise, but you have no way of knowing if you don't have the longer bands. And uh, these are the SED reconstructions for the four galaxies. And uh, another interesting lesson is that we took the early papers and uh, we compared where they were placed by the various authors when the authors had the same objects in the sample. So in some cases, you have great agreement, like these four groups all agree that this object is about here. But in some cases, like this one or that one, there is big disagreement between different groups. So uh, that's a cautionary note about you know being careful. Um, spend more than 24 hours before submitting the paper. There are a lot of lessons on, on that. But uh, so things tend to converge the more people uh, work on this. But unfortunately, or fortunately, it's a tradition of our field to have evolving versus instant satisfaction and publication on Twitter, uh, which may not be the best thing for science. So the other thing that I've been doing, I have three quad lenses. And uh, I was hoping for some quick wins on those, and then to work with uh, Tommaso Treo's group to do the, the cosmochronography detailed analysis. Uh, I haven't any quick win. The reason I was hoping on quick wins is that you should never see four images. Uh, Gravitational lensing all, only gives an odd number of images. So you shouldn't see four, you should see five. Why you never see the fifth? Because the fifth is demagnified and passes essentially through the lens. In fact, one of the few cases where we see five is a case where the lens is a binary galaxy, so there is actually nothing in the center of mass, and you see the little demagnified fifth image. When you have a galaxy there, of course, it's hard to see a little demagnified blip in, uh, in the center of a galaxy. 
Plus, if the galaxy has some dust, it will be even further suppressed. I was hoping to be able to see it because uh, I thought I'm taking IFUs. These are data cubes where each pixel is a spectrum. So if I see a pixel in the, in the elliptical that has the broad line region at the redshift of the quasar, I know that that's the fifth image. Unfortunately, this was a lot easier to say than do. And one of the problems, particularly for things like this, is that the quasars are bright and their diffraction spike and and the PSF of JWST has lots of diffraction spikes, so the chances that one of those diffraction spikes that carries with it also the broad line will overlap the lens is non-zero. So you need to do a, a more detailed analysis rather than just looking at the data and say, ah, oh, I see the fifth image. Uh, and so we are still working on that. And this is the third one. Oh, sorry. The third one actually is in a nice group of galaxies. I, I thought I'd show you the group instead of just the quad. And uh, so we are working on, the, on this data still, and I don't have any results to, to talk about. Uh, I can advertise, though, one of our tools. This is uh, uh, CubeVis, which is a visualizer of the data cubes. So if you access the archive, for public data or data of which you are PI, you see a little icon. And if you right click on that icon, these things will come up. And it shows you the, you know, the image from the data cube, either integrated or, as in this case, at the selected wavelength. It will show you the noise. And it will show you the integrated spectrum of the data cube. Or if you select a little area or a pixel, the spectrum of that pixel. So it's a very nice tool for quick analysis of your data cubes. And it's available without even having to download the data, just for exploration on the archive for public data. And uh, so after this, I'm getting to my summary. So I believe JWST is on its way to revolutionize astronomy, which is you know, the reason it was built. Uh, I think that our models of galaxy formation are being placed under pressure by the fact that we see more and brighter galaxies at higher redshift. Uh, and we'll see what comes out of that. And the cycle two program that was just selected uh, will continue to push in the envelope of what is possible. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Massimo. I think you understand the exciting times that we are living in. And so it's time for questions, if you, if you have any. Also, maybe some part have been uh, uh, more specific. So if you just want need some clarifications on the, science topic, the scientific topic, you can, you can raise your hand. If you work on a mission like this, you need to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot to mention, I've been working on this uh, since essentially 96, early 96. So it took many years to get it to launch. And my oldest son will be 20 in fall. So, you know, JWST is, uh, is older than my son in some sense. <laughs> I, I just start with one question because you mentioned that uh, HST uh, is uh, still very useful for the contamination of low redshift exploration. So is it possible that HST will survive as much as JWST? We don't talk about it, but we know that HST will never die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there is, seriously, there is a serious discussion with various companies, including SpaceX, to do a boost. Uh, it, it's not necessarily going to happen. One of the problems of, J, of a Hubble is that it's in low Earth orbit, and when you have a solar cycle, the sun in, at the maximum inflates the Earth's atmosphere that intrusive, in, increases the drag, so the altitude of Hubble goes down. And so you need 
you know, when we were doing the surface emission, we would also push it up. Now, uh, we were lucky that there was a low, a low cycle with a low maximum, so it didn't go down too much, but we're getting to the point where it needs to be boosted. So boosting it is something that is, in quotes, easy. And, and so there are discussions to see uh, that it could be done. Uh, you know, if it was my call, which is not, because I'm not working on Humble anymore, I would want to boost it above the satellite constellations so that you know, we are nice and safe. Uh, Servicing it is a totally different story. It's much more complicated for a variety of reasons, but at least uh, while it works, pushing it up should be more reasonable. Thanks. I'll come to you. That's it. Uh, I just had a question about how do you tackle the different, uh, the scheduling of the actual observations, because of course uh, you have to spend fuel, I believe, to steer the telescope to different points of observation. And I just had a question of how that can impact uh, how research is done and if someone has to like go back to a previous, you know, location in the, in the field of observation. So so we don't use fuel to steer. I mean, we apply torque to the reaction wheels, and so they spin in one direction, and the observatory spins in the other direction. Uh, however, when you do this, if you have a random distribution of targets in the sky, you start, and, and by the way, you accumulate angular momentum, because if you are in a position with a solar panel that is not symmetrical, which is almost always, you will have pressure from, uh, from the sun that also contributes torque. So the reaction wheels accumulate that torque. You end up having some sort of random walk in the space of angular momentum. And uh, occasionally, you know, you will start accumulating angular momentum and the spins will, the spin of the wheels will be faster and faster and then you need to dump that angular momentum. Since we are in L2, we cannot dump it on the, using the Earth magnetic field, and we need to dump it uh, this time using the thrusters. So that's a factor. We monitor it. We don't actively maintain it at this time, just because we have a lot of fuel. And we knew that this would happen, so the, the requirement for fuel was calculated, including this effect. Usually, we, we actually don't accumulate a lot. It's one of the things that every week when we have the plan for the next week, we track. And usually, angular momentum stays low because you observe something there and then you go in another place. You know. But there are specific times when you do certain type of observation then you start accumulating angular momentum and then we do what we call an angular momentum dump where you use the thruster to unload the wheels. Uh, the scheduling. It's complicated. There are a lot of preferences and constraints and so on. You know, you need to stay within the data volume that you can download. You need to, if there are proposals that have particular constraints, like low backgrounds or whatever, um, you need to take that into account. If you have exoplanet transits, for instance, you need to catch the time of the transit. If you have solar system observations, they tend to be more constrained. So there are a lot of parameters. Uh, we have a lot of experience with the software that we use to do the scheduling. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's a little bit of an art, but you know, something in between art and science. And we have people that are very experienced. It's the same group that schedules Hubble and has done so for 30 years and schedules JWST. Thank you. Uh, I was talking about the observing scheduling. What about the proposal selection? Can you just comment about the procedure? So the proposal selection is done uh, similar to what has been done lately with Hubble. Uh, we use a double anonymous review, uh, so proposers don't know who the reviewers will be, it's only known post facto, 
and the reviewers don't know who wrote the proposal. The proposals need to be anonym anonymized. And the idea is to remove biases of any kind. Uh, we have discovered, it was introduced initially to remove gender bias. We have been detected looking at uh, years of Hubble proposals. But we have discovered that it eliminates other types of bias. Uh, for instance, we have more junior PIs than uh, before. We have more um, uniform distribution in the universities of, of PI uh, uh, affiliations. So, I mean, the whole thing is, uh, you know, if you are a famous person from a famous university and people see your name, you had a higher chance of getting the time. Now you have the same chance as, uh, as everybody else because ideally you just check the, the scientific justification. Initially we were reasonably uh, tolerant, but uh, now since it's a few years that we are doing it, if somebody blatantly violates the anonymity, the proposal is not reviewed, it's rejected before review. Talking uh, about uh, <coughs> observatories in general, on Earth uh, and in space, which is the ratio between data production and uh, data elaboration and studies? Um, are scientists uh, overwhelmed uh, uh, for all the data that is produced, or? Uh, are they already dreaming about uh, the next uh, big space telescope? I... So, uh, also, uh, is uh, something uh, at risk uh, of uh, fly under the radar because there's too much to uh, analyze? No, uh, so I, I don't know how to answer the, everything you asked. I, I, I don't have statistics about you know, ground-based observatories and so on, so uh, I don't know. In terms of space observatories, um, everything in one year or less, depending on the proposal, is public. So if somebody doesn't have the time to look at their data, uh, someone else will access the archive and, uh, and, and, and work and be able to work on the data. Um, and in fact, if they are affiliated to a US institution, you can ask for grants to study archival data. So you can even apply for funding to, to analyze data that are in the archive. Um, yes, there are new observatories coming. One is Roman that I mentioned in the context of the pairing stability supernovae that is being developed. It's a 2.4 meter telescope, roughly the same, you know, the same size as Hubble, but with a large field of view camera. And, uh, and the, the National Academy of Sciences uh, Decadal Surveys has uh, recommended a, a planet finding mission for the next flagship, which we could call Habitable Worlds Observer. That's a kind of super Hubble, you know, like, uh, web-sized or bigger, but with UV optical capabilities. And the reason we need that for exoplanets is that web will be very powerful for studying planets around red dwarfs for a variety of reasons. The habitable zone is close in because the star has low luminosity, so the period of the orbit is short. And so that means in one year we can have many transits, and we can add the statistics from many transits. Moreover, the planet is big compared to the star because the star is, is, small, is smaller. And so, you know, it's still big, but it, the relatively size difference is smaller. And so the signal is a little bigger. And so we can do a lot with red dwarf stars. If you are now trying to find an analog of the Earth around an analog of the Sun, the Earth is much smaller than the Sun because the Sun is, is a G-dwarf, not a red dwarf. And 
the period is one year. So you don't have as many transits available. You need to wait one year per transit, unlike the red dwarfs. So the signal is smaller, and it's harder to build statistics. So people realize that transits are not the way to go for G star. So this observatory, the future one, is designed to have a coronagraph that instead of having a suppression of 10 minus 4 or 5, like JWST, or 10 minus 8, as is programmed for Roman, will have uh, 10 minus 10. So if you suppress the star by, by you know, a factor 10 to the 10, you can see the planet. You don't need any particular phase. And you can integrate for a month or two to get the spectrum of the atmosphere of the planet and see its characteristics. So that's why it's a big telescope with exquisite optical quality so that it can suppress the starlight to that degree. And of course, once you have a telescope like that, you, there is a lot of extra science you can do beyond exoplanets. So there is a new frontier, uh, but it will take time and it won't be, it won't be cheap. I can just, uh, I think it might be interesting for, 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 for the students in particular uh, to understand uh, what is the competition or the complementarity between uh, a 6.5 uh, meter telescope in the space uh, with respect to um, a telescope which is going to be built by the European Southern Observatory, a 40 meter telescope uh, on ground. So we will have in the next year luckily, a uh, 40 meter from ground with respect to C.5. So I'm sure it's interesting to see one bit uh, the others in the different science. What is your feeling about that? Well, I, I, I haven't worried about that in a while. Uh, there are certain areas where each is a clear winner. For instance, we don't have high resolution spectrographs on web. So if you need 10,000 or 30,000, 100,000, in terms of resolving power in spectroscopy, obviously you want to go to the ground-based telescope. We have mid-infrared, which you cannot observe easily from the ground. I mean, the, the, because the Earth is warm. <laughs> so uh, once you go to the mid-infrared, the, the background advantage uh, of JWST is enormous. And then there is the middle ground, you know, moderate resolving power, imaging, and so on. And that really depends on the details. What is the, um, you know, the, the trick in this game is always when you compare a facility that is designed with a facility that exists, the design one always wins. Once both exist, <laughs> you can compare reality with reality and see you know, what the actual performance is. And I'm sure there will be things where you know, one wins and things where the other one wins. It certainly there is, it, rather than a competition, I would see it as a, as a synergy. There are certainly areas where each is much better than the, you know, where one is much better than the other. So the, the synergies are probably the most valuable uh, thing to consider. Yes, I, I have a question about, uh, uh, you mentioned that you measure correlated times from a distant source that travel to different paths uh, after the cosmological tension, no? You mentioned, yeah. 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 But uh, w w this correlation times can be enormous in difference or not? This uh, it depends. Usually, it, it depends on a lot on the, the lens and so on, but you know, they usually look at months or weeks. Uh, it depends on the particular lens. So typically these studies are done from the ground because you don't need, you know, to do monitoring of quasars, you don't need a particularly large telescope or, or space. You just get the, the curve, the flux is a function of time, and once you have it, you can do the the correlations. Uh, we have had, uh, with Hubble, we have had some cases of a strongly lensed supernova, uh, a supernova exploding in a lensed galaxy. 
And so when that happens, you can predict, you know, the delay from the model of the various galaxy images, and you can predict, oh, the supernova will appear on that image. Uh, in, and that type of experiment has been done. And it, you know, it's very powerful. And, and there, again, it's usually months. Okay, so uh, I was wondering, usually when you, when you build something like this, you have to make a lot of assumptions about everything, about like distancing and properties of some objects. So I was wondering which assumptions you made during the building of the James Webb and what were proven right or wrong by you know, recent measurements or even could be proven right or wrong in the future. Um, there were really not a lot of assumptions in the sense that essentially one of the requirements was to try to have enough sensitivity. And so the way we got the sensitivity was to say, well, we want this telescope, you know, let's take the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. We can go X number of magnitudes below the typical galaxy luminosity, say two magnitudes below L star. Okay, we want Webb to be able to go two magnitudes below L star at redshift 15. So to make sure that you would have enough sensitivity to see if the luminosity function evolves over that drive. And that drove the requirements of going to about 10 nanojansky for, for near camp. Uh, for 10,000 seconds exposures. So it was pretty broad requirements. We had some requirements uh, for uh, the ability to see, um, to measure emission lines. One was, suppose that you have a galaxy, you want to spend 100,000 seconds, and you have a galaxy that is lensed by a factor of 10. Uh, I want to be able to measure its oxygen abundance even if it's 10 minus 3 solar. Because 10 minus 3 solar is a reasonable, reasonably low metallicity that if you say, oh, this is primordial, people won't, won't get too upset. If it's higher than that, it's not primordial. If it's lower than that, probably you start not to see the difference. You know, like uh, Lyman alpha equivalent width at the at a thousand solar or below doesn't change as much, but it's much higher at a thousand solar than at 100 solar. So, you know, we want to measure the metallicity of very metal poor galaxies. So these are the type of science requirements. In fact, we have very few. We have the sensitivity one. We have a spectroscopic limit for multi-object, which drove the multi-object spectroscopy. And we have the moving target, and we had the ability measuring things in the mid-infrared. These are the level one science requirements that drove uh, the mission. Those are the ones that are hard to change. And then each instrument had additional requirements, uh, which we call the level two, the derived requirements, and those could be changed if hard to, to meet. So uh, it's, it's always a little bit of a give and take between how difficult it is to do it, how much uh, does it cost, and so on. But the level one, you try, not to, you try not to change. So for instance, if we had discovered that doing the multi-object spectroscopy was impossible, they would have violated the level one requirement. So that would have been a big thing. Um, um, this is going probably to be a kind of naive question, but I, I fully understand why the L2 point is used. Uh, now, are there any of the other Lagrangian points ever used to park a satellite? Oh, not necessarily for astronomical reasons, for whatever reason. And secondly, since there are several um, um, space um, objects, let's say, satellites orbiting around L2, 
you know, that space becoming a little bit too crowded uh, in perspective because they are no, never going to get destroyed anyway. So they stay there forever. So um, L2 has the advantage that uh, as the Earth and the Sun always in that direction, so if you have an orbit around L2 large enough that you, the Moon doesn't eclipse you too often, you always have solar energy and you have a, you know, a, a line of sight to the Earth for communications. Um, the uh, L1, I think, is the one between the Earth and the Sun. That one is good if you have a Sun observing mission. So certain mission have used L1 because they needed to observe the Sun. L3, if I'm not mistaken, is the other side, <laughs> so that's a little bit too far. Uh, and uh, and L4 and L5 are very distant. They are, you know, um, it's a tri an, equilater an equilateral triangle, so they are very distant from the Earth. So, um, so they are, you know, yeah, they are not practical. So effectively, L2 for, for astronomy missions is the best. Space is big, so we, Hopefully, won't have any collisions. Um, you know, that's why we have our laser gun battery to shoot down anything. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> we just hope we don't. <laughs> you know, space is big. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't shoot down that one. Uh, so uh, the telescope is designed expecting micrometeorite damage. And so um, we have a lot of very small things that hit us from now and then. And, uh, but the rate and the damage is pretty low. So we revisited that. And if you ignore that one in about May last year, uh, we will maintain very good optical quality for 20 years. So there is no real worry of degradation from, the, from these very small events. Last year, we had one that was anomalously large, uh, much bigger than expected. Despite that, you know, everything is relative. <laughs> you know, we're still much better than uh, requirement in terms of optical quality. We're still you know, a factor two better than requirement. But still, uh, we don't want to be hit by things like that too, too often. So there were a lot of studies revisiting micrometeorite models, revisiting damage models. I think it's fair to say we don't yet understand too much how that happened. We are pleased that we haven't seen it again. Uh, I would vote for not seeing it again. It's one of the things where I prefer small, num small number statistics. Uh, and uh, for now, until we understand a little bit better, including through modeling that is going on, uh, we, as a safety measure, we are avoiding as much as possible looking in the RAM direction. Certain micrometeorites have a 30 kilometers per second dispersion, uh, random motions. So if you move, the telescope moves at roughly 30, 29 kilometers per second. So if you move toward the 30 kilometers per second random cloud at 30 kilometers per second, you could be hit sometimes by things that go at 60 kilometers per second or, or more. And you want to avoid that. Uh, so we try for cycle two to spend most of our time looking in the other direction so that any impact would be over the more robust backside. And, uh, and then we'll reevaluate uh, both the impact of, of doing that and, uh, and we'll, we'll have you know, better understanding of what. We think it was probably more energetic than the mean particle that hit us in a place where it would be more, it would have a bigger effect. So it wasn't just the energy, it was a combination of the energy and where it hit. 
but we are not 100% sure. Um, yeah, so this is maybe more of an engineering question, but you mentioned that you were able to calibrate the mirrors at the scale of nanometers. Yeah. Can you say something about how this is possible? Like, uh... We are using a variety of techniques. One of them is um, uh, dispersed Hartmann sensing. So we have uh, dispersing you know, prisms, and we, and we get the spectrum uh, from, from one object in two segments. And, uh, and what you see in the spectra tell you the relative displacement of the two, of the two uh, segments. So working pairwise, pair by pair, you can align them. Uh, we also do uh, tests in uh, using what we call MIMF, which is multi-image, multi-field, multi multi-instrument. Uh, this is because if you only work on axis, two segments could be coherently adding in, uh, on axis, but they could be exactly one phase off. And so when you go off axis, they would no longer be aligned because that phase difference becomes visible. And so in order to make sure that there is no this phase difference, you do multi-field and multi-instrument over the whole field of view, the, the picture I showed you with all the instruments, and that tells you that you have a single, that the focal surface is a single surface without phase errors. Uh, we, can, we have weak lenses that allows us to take an image of the pupil, which we use for some application. So we have a variety of techniques that uh, we had backup techniques that would allow us to uh, align the mirror without using these techniques, using the nearest instrument as a non-redundant mask. Essentially, you throw away a large fraction of the collecting area of the telescope to build an interferometer. And that can be used to also to align uh, uh, the, 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 the mirror. So it's a, it's a big, um, a lot of techniques and backup techniques. This was uh, tested countless times. Ball Aerospace built uh, a, a small scale prototype that was used to explore the first concepts. And then uh, various algorithms were tried. I, I think some trips to CAC were <laughs> happened, and then uh, people started doing sophisticated simulations where a group would not know the state of the mirror and another group would align it to try to verify the, the algorithm. When we were doing the alignment, the primary software we used has been developed by Ball Aerospace. So we had the Ball person with the Ball software. Then we had uh, what we would call shadow which was an institute person using the Bolt software. And then we had two different types of software independent of that, but you know, using similar algorithms. And so often when we had to decide what next, we would have like four different models that would, you know, when you get agreement by all four, you're pretty confident you're doing the right thing. So, and, and each segment says, uh, can move and tilt or change its curvature. So all, all parameters are in principle open. There are, there are a couple of questions from uh, online. There's a question from the Zoom webinar. Uh, can you say something about comets? If uh, there is any way to study um, moving objects, uh, like you said, um, but moving objects like comets, maybe I think away from the sun when they, they are? So uh, we observed, uh, I don't remember the parameters now, but we observed and took a spectrum of comet hale bob that passed near the sun, what is it? Many years ago. Uh, pardon? 99, maybe. No, no. maybe, you know, anyway. 98. 97, oh my God. <laughs> so, so, of course, in 25 years, it has moved. I think it's probably, is now cold, no tail, no nothing. Uh, and it's, I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's past the orbit of 
Pluto, but it's certainly pretty far away. And uh, when I saw my comment was, you can run, but you can't hide, because we took a spectrum of it anyway. So the limit for nearby comets is how fast they move, because it would be very hard for us to go above 100 milliard second per second. So if it's a, a very nearby comet with very large apparent motion, that would be the limiting factor. But as long as the apparent motion is, uh, is small, yes, we'll, we'll see them. Recently, we saw, we took a spectrum of a body in the solar system, there was a press release, that has water but no carbon dioxide, which was a, a little bit of a surprise. So we, we certainly can. Well, another question is about, uh, are there any incorporation of AI in space missions? <laughs> um, I think it's a difficult question. Not really what people call AI now. JWST uses, uh, we call it event-driven observing. So uh, a typical spacecraft has the commanding on the ground and uh, flight software on board. We decided what we wanted to do with JWST was too complicated for flight software. Flight software has certain standards of development that are very demanding and uh, what we wanted to do was to complicate it for those standards. So we developed the OSS, the onboard script subsystems. These are routines written in JavaScript that are tested to a high level of standard and run on the spacecraft, but are developed by us uh, rather than the instrument builders. And uh, they are sophisticated enough that can allow us to do things like, you know, with Hubble, you have a precise schedule. You know, at 9 o'clock you observe this target, at 10, 13 you observe this target, and so on and so forth. And if the observation at 9 o'clock fails because the guide star wasn't there or whatever, you don't do anything until the next observation. JWST, within certain con constraints, uh, if it fails an observation, can say, oh, let me see if I can do something else. Oh, at 10 o'clock, it looks like I can start it now. So that kind of limited intelligence is what we can do thanks to the OSS. And, uh, and so that's, that's what we're doing. The system could, in principle, be more powerful, but uh, this was the first time that something like this was tried. But it's certainly not AI. <laughs> One more. One more. Um, uh, why um, did you decide to uh, build um, hexagons, uh, mirrors, and uh, how you decided to um, b build the, the entire mirror itself? So, uh, so hexagons tile. It's one of the solids that can tile a plane. You could, you know, you could use squares, or you could use hexagons. Circles will leave little holes in there. So, hexagons is the, you know, the closest, simplest approximation to a circle that tiles. So that's uh, that was the the, the natural choice. Uh, Plus, I was playing war games when I was a kid, and we had hexagonal maps. So. Uh, the, uh, and then you have, uh, you know, you have to assemble them in something that is roughly round to get a decent PSF, and so that leads you to another hexagon build of hexagons. And in fact, it it has a name which I forget what that saw that figure is. Uh, I won't even try to repeat it, but it has a name, that shape. And, uh, and the, the features of the PSF are actually related to the fact that it's an hexagon built of hexagons, and that tells you the various angles and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it allows you to understand the point spread function. Um, so that's. Well, maybe since time is going faster, we pick uh, one. Uh, 
the last uh, question. We cannot make all of them from online. So do you expect to observe more clumpy galaxies at high redshift with respect to what Abol observed, just to jump back to the high redshift galaxies? So clumpy galaxies. It depends. Um, so uh, very naively, uh, when you observe the star forming part, the youngest part of a galaxy, you may expect it to be clumpy. So as you move to the infrared, you may see the older population, so maybe it's less clumpy. On the other hand, with JWST, you can do sufficient in the infrared that you see the, the mid-infrared, the, the, the hot dust emission uh, from the star forming regions. So. So I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. We have 20 years of time to, to answer that. So I think uh, uh, we, it's a quick one. We try. OK, yes, because uh, I don't want to say no. To, but this is the last one. As uh, James Webb uh, Telescope Project uh, start uh, when uh, HST was launched, uh, you are uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, new telescope launch, and uh, which is the probability of uh, uh, the next telescope um, have uh, b folding mirrors? Oh, so uh, zero, because you never make the same mistake twice. So it will have some other problem, maybe, but not that one. The, um, so as I mentioned, the National Academy of Sciences recommended a the next flagship, which is this Habitable Worlds Observer. And they talk about 2040, 2045 as a launch date. So it's, it will, will take a fair amount of time to develop it. Uh, whenever there is a problem, people spend a lot of time uh, with lessons learned to avoid making that mistake. So we had a lot of people that investigated in detail what exactly happened with Hubble to make sure we wouldn't make the same mistake. And now the surprise for us, it wasn't a devastating problem, but it was a surprise, was the big micrometeorite. So probably Habitable World Observer will have a, a shroud that reduces the solid angle where you are vulnerable to micrometeorite to reduce the probability of that. Uh, you know, with active optics, it's hard to make the same mistake uh, that Hubble had. Uh, in fact, Hubble had active optics, but the, the actuators are, you know, very primitive and the mirror is very rigid. So it could not be changed anywhere near what it would be needed to correct spherical aberration. Uh, we, you know, with web, uh, we had a lot more range. So, uh, and there is no reason to believe that the new one wouldn't have a similar range. So. Okay, so I think we can, we can say that after just one year from the release, uh, less than one year from the release of the first images, the archive is already so rich that uh, uh, there is material still already for many master students, I would say, if yeah. they have curiosity and things to work about that. So it was really a pleasure for us. I've seen the, 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 the public was very active, so we, we all get uh, interested in that. And we really are very thankful for, for your presence here. He came uh, oppositely for this from, from Baltimore, so it was a long, <laughs> not from L2, but from uh, Baltimore. So thanks, Massimo from all of us. Thank you for inviting us.